Oh, I yeah, this is starting here. Okay, those online, can you can you mute your mics, please? You're coming out live. Okay, we are uh, now live on YouTube. Apologies to those who may have been waiting for a few minutes for us uh, to come through, but we've already had an extensive private session um, of the the board this morning, and we're now come to the session in uh, public. Uh, so good afternoon to everyone who is joining us and welcome to our board members, some of whom are in the room, the majority are in the room, and also for a number who are uh, with us uh, via Zoom uh, and online. Uh, and to those who are of the public who are joining us again, you're very welcome. Uh, Chief Constable, thank you for joining us again and to all of your team who are uh, with you. Uh, we give you our welcome. It's a new term for uh, uh, our returning political member, uh, Lilla, uh, Lil Linda Dillon, if I could speak properly, it would help. Uh, Linda's very welcome back with us again, but not feeling so well, so uh, we hope she feels better again soon. Since our last meeting in July, there have been a number of policing issues of note. Some of those, Chief Constable, you have covered off uh, on your report. However, as uh, we've already discussed in private session, uh, most of this today will be around the South Armagh Review, um, which has drawn significant commentary and for some recommendations, political controversy. As a board, we received an early briefing on the findings and recommendations with the board agreeing to give the report further scrutiny and discussion at today's meeting. At the heart of this review is undoubtedly the desire to improve policing with the community in South Armagh area. As with all other areas across Northern Ireland, there must be good working relations and service delivery in a community orientated way. We know there are other areas where confidence in policing has been damaged and where relations need repaired. So these issues need addressing in the round going forward. A number of recommendations in this review relate to day-to-day -day supervision and management activity. So there is a legitimate question as to why some practices existed for so long. There are other recommendations that the board wants to examine further through committee structures, particularly those around culture, relationships and partnerships and also the role of the local policing and community safety partnership within that. The board wishes to see an action plan on how the PSNI now intends to progress the review recommendations, but there are particular questions on aspects of the findings today and also on the public clarifications that you've since provided uh, that uh, we're all waiting to hear about. So with that in mind, Chief Counsel, I'll ask for your uh, opening statement and then we'll go to questions. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to um, clarify some of what we said and also the sort of sense of direction that you want to see from us in countability terms to actually manage some of the recommendations in the report. Uh, I do think it's really important today, in light of some of the political and media reaction to the findings of the South Omar Review, that my open remarks in this accountability meeting build upon the briefing that, as you say, Chair, we gave you on the 5th of July, to provide further clarification on our decision making to date and our intent going forward to draw a line under some of the interpretation of our findings. As you've said yourself, the vast majority of the review's 50 recommendations are about ensuring better visibility, better community policing for the whole community and improved operational effectiveness by better working practices and support for local officers. It's true to say that a small number of recommendations are, however, sensitive and have wider organisational significance. Such issues inevitably have attracted commentary. There is no doubt that issues about respectfully treating memorials in particular have been difficult and we're at pains to recognise from the outset, that, including at the community event, how important this was when we addressed this matter head on on Tuesday. I want to take this opportunity to set the record straight on what was and what has not been agreed. And I hope that this will provide clarity and assurance to you and others going forwards and calm some of the rhetoric. What is absolutely not true is that all the recommendations are a fait accompli, and Mark may be able to put detail to this later. We're at the starting gates and the review report is an original document, which is important to stress in governance terms we received as a senior team from someone else. We now need to process within tried and trusted arrangements and procedures internally and with yourselves. This will inform 
the development of the policing approach going forward, which, as we agreed in the minutes of our own meeting earlier this year, will be prioritised by Mark as the Deputy Chief Constable. I want to assure you that decision making at all times will be measured, con considered and accountable to this board. You will recall that the board was briefed and all members received copies of the report at the beginning of July. A community stakeholder briefing took place on Tuesday of this week, at which point the report was published for the first time. At the event, which was attended by local political parties, I outlined a number of qualifications to the report and offered those present an opportunity to, to hear firsthand our thinking ideas and proposals for the sake of the community and also for the sake of those who lost, lost loved ones policing this part of the country. On each of these occasions, I've explained that there are aspects of the report which are not given. And it's important that despite the unhelpful rhetoric from some quarters, there is no misunderstanding on a number of critical issues. So firstly, in relation to memorials, we are not removing memorials and never have been. We will not be progressing this element of recommendation six. However, with police station closure and redevelopment comes an inevitable requirement to consider how best to manage the transition of memorials and honour our fallen colleagues. When this time comes, this will be handled properly and with sensitivity, with full consultation with the families of those who were murdered, the living policing in South Omar. Far from disrespecting or forgetting our 30 colleagues who paid the ultimate price, I think we can do better than what we currently have in place. And over the horizon, plans for a new police muse museum may reflect this. In terms of cross-border policing, let me be categorically clear on this issue. Wording within the report has been misunderstood. Neither the review nor the police service at any time has considered or envisaged all island policing structures and joint day-to-day -day patrolling. Recommendations 45 to 49 relate to cross-border arrangements and seek to ensure better and more effective real-time communication and collaboration with our colleagues in an Angarda Shikona. What was envisaged was modelled on established local structures which work well under the already existing joint agency task force arrangements in tackling serious and organised crime. The proposal is for this model to be adapted to everyday crime prevention, such as burglary, theft, drug supply, and also road safety issues, which are packed upon the lives of people living on both sides of the border. This is merely a practical approach to effectively tackling crime, bringing offenders to justice, and improving community safety. Accountability structures infer nothing more than better collaboration and consistency at a local level on shared and mutually agreed operational priorities. The idea of hot pursuit that was proposed in limited and carefully defined circumstances only, in any case, we recognise would require governmental and wider political support to take forward. In terms of officer safety and noting the Federation in the meeting today, internally, officer morale, safety and support remain paramount. Ideas in the report were shaped to reflect the views of local Federation representatives to ensure they and the workforce had a local voice too. Officer safety will not be compromised on my watch. In terms of the Irish language, recommendation 38 suggests that opportunities are explored to promote the use of minority languages in general. Any agreed progress requires a legislative framework in lockstep with the wider public sector. Until then, this proposal remains dormant. In relation to training and development, issue, commentary has arisen around recommendation 43, particularly in relation to external community input. It's worth stressing it's not unusual for us to obtain inputs from outside the organisation, and in fact there are clear benefits in doing so, particularly in an area where training was neglected and historic trust and competence issues have arisen. Neighbourhood police officers need to be equipped with the best skills and knowledge to perform their role understanding diverse perspectives beyond their own personal experiences and reflective of the needs and expectations of the whole local community. So I would like to reassure members that any such package will be balanced, 
and point to the wording in the recommendation which specifically suggests that there would be benefit to design and accreditation by a higher education institute partner to give this particular recommendation credibility and legitimacy. Finally, in terms of implementation, whilst immediate progress has been made at a local level on some of the more operationally focused quick wins, such as vehicle visibility, formal implementation structures led by Mark have yet to be fully put in place. Further consultation with stakeholders has always been envisaged as a key part of a prioritised process as previously outlined in our executive summary. In fact, this is a requirement that was specifically recommended, recommended by the review. So I would like to reassure you all that implementation of the review's findings will take a structured, measured and consultative approach, acknowledging the need to flex recommendations as the practical outworkings are adapted to a real world setting over the next number of years, reporting to this board, as you say, Chair, on progress at agreed levels and timescales. So I hope this has provided some clarity and reassurance and reinforces our commitment to address mutually agreed inequities in policing this part of the country. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Chief Constable, for the further clarification that you have given there. We'll go straight into questions, starting with the question from independent member Edgar Jardine, and then bringing in some of the political members uh, in the order of uh, Trevor, Liz, and Mike, and then we'll go beyond that. So, firstly, Edgar. Thank, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Chief, for your report. Uh, my question is in relation to the uh, review report on South Armagh. Uh, clearly, community perspectives were obviously rightly uh, and uh, core to the review. The report includes reports on two surveys, one from the Community Restorative Justice Organisation and one from PCSP. Uh, interestingly, with quite different findings, with the CRG survey much more critical than the PCSP, the first question is how can the how was the CRG CRJ survey commissioned, uh, and what assurance did the review team have that the respondents to the CRJ survey were representative of the population? And the second also relates to the methodology. Uh, there is reference to uh, consulting with faith groups, and uh, I just would like to ask about which faith groups were consulted and responded. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Edgar. Um, right, in terms of the survey methodology, I, I think there's a few things uh, to take into account. Firstly, in a, in a gold standard world, you might have chosen to use some sort of um, external provider, you know, Ipsos Mori or something like that, but we were conscious of the public purse, notwithstanding the importance of this report, and had to make some practical compromises given the pressure on budgets. So there was a lot of thought given to this by the review team. Uh, and I suppose there was two routes taken. And, and I suppose in terms of representativeness, that sort of goes to the heart of your question. Clearly the PCSP are a critical partner in that part of the country, as indeed they are in other parts of Northern Ireland. But their survey only yielded 22 responses. So there has to be a question mark of actually how representative that can ever be. CRJ sort of, volunteered as it were to open doors to where we couldn't reach and you see that in the report itself one of the recommendations about improved community networks because it was actually evident that they, they weren't as good as they could have been in the first place so we didn't actually have the links ourselves right across the community to go through doors um, wherever that happened to be to try and get views so they facilitated that um, we cannot influence who actually responded, but it was tried to be done as a, a neutral way as possible. So it wasn't, if you like, I'm just sending an email to my mates type of survey. They were left in, in shops as one example where anyone from the community could go and take them away and fill them in. So, and there were other things done like using businesses and other, other sort of interested groups to try and promote the survey on our wider behalf. So that that was the best that we thought we could do within the time, the resources and the context to do that. There was dialogue with the faith groups. I, I think I'll have to get your specific bit of detail outside of the meeting to say just who said what, so I don't misspeak on that important issue, but it was part of the collection of evidence, but we can provide you that information in writing. Okay, thank you. Moving on to political members, and first up, Trevor Clark. Thank you, Chair. 
Chief Constable, in the private session, um, you had some helpful remarks, and indeed, um, in this public session, you have some remarks clarifying the position. However, if I could draw you to the report, um, the report still does talk. I mean, I mean, the, the two hot topics for me personally are memorials and the cross-border stuff. If we look at recommendation 45 in the report, it does talk about facilitating joint rather than parallel uh, policing, and it talks about as a minimum, uh, which would enable cross-border pursuits. That sounds different than what you've just said in terms of your opening remarks. Also, in terms of the last section of recommendation six, it says rebalance the emphasis on the past by exploring the relocation of memorials to an agreed space in the station away from public locations and main thoroughfares. Again, that stands in stark contrast to what you have said in relation to that. So what would you say to unionist concerns, or indeed maybe wider than unionist concerns, in relation to both those sections of the recommendations? Thanks, Trevor, for raising that. And maybe it's an important opportunity to try and clarify this. Um, many people will have the report in, in front of them. And in the specifics, you'll see that recommendation six relates to both Cross McGlenn and Newton Hamilton police stations. And it, it is sort of a, a phased journey. Um, in relation to recommendation six, and I think you'll probably have it in front of you um, as, as, as well. Um, the, the specific bits which we refer to, and I know it's the issue that has caused most consternation is if anyone's looking at the, the main report, it's on page 110. You go part way down through that page. And this was taken in the context of the whole. And we received the report as a senior management board on two occasions in November as, as an interim set of proposals and then a final review in March. So in a sense, it was like passing the baton. So I, I commissioned the report for well-rehearsed reasons. I think in terms of honesty, openness and transparency, it wasn't a report we sought to influence or fetter. So the report is the views of the authors that reflect the concerns that were raised by members of the public, wider stakeholders, political representatives, and indeed the workforce. They synthesized that and brought the recommendations to us. I think the mistake is that because this has gone in the public domain under corporate branding, people maybe quite understandably come to a conclusion, it's in here, therefore it must be true. But what happened in the meeting that we were in, where Mark supported this, this debate really sort of vigorously, that we recognized for a whole host of reasons, we were not ready to take forward this recommendation in the terms it was written. It was just the wrong time uh, in, 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 the, in, in, in the wrong era. So we put that absolutely unequivocally to one side, but we did recognize, as I said in my opening remarks, Trevor, that if we come out of a police station, we need to have a process that enables us to remove artifacts and memorials there in a sensitive and joined up way with people that quite rightly would have a vested interest. And that is what I think is at the heart of this. So I think for the, for the sake of clarity, I say again, we are not removing memorials. This was the original proposal from, if you like, the working group. We discounted that as a senior board, but we do recognize that if a police station closes, the last thing we want is a memorial not to be respected and you know, in the worst of scenarios, end up somewhere we wouldn't want to see it. And at the point of exit, how do we make sure that that's treated in a respectful way, hence the word? So, so I accept, I mean, in those circumstances where a station closes, mm. clearly something has to be done, and I, I accept it would have to be done in a respectful way. However, the report we have today that's linked to mm. today's meeting still mm. references the, the, the relocation away from uh, public locations and main thoroughfares. Mm. There's a section that I read out in section 46 mm. where in relation to the, the, the joint policing. Would you not be in the position, given that the concerns and the obviously the, the debate that this has caused the last few days, to step back from this report and republish the report with these sections removed? That would remove any ambiguity in relation to that, and we could probably find a way forward with some of the other very good recommendations mm. that has been lost. I mean, we did it, we all did here. On the 5th of July, about the one million pounds of overtime for members of the, the, the police to stay mm. inside a station. Mm. For me, I would much rather those police officers are out on the ground much more uh, frequently and more effectively. Mm. But I think all of that detail has been lost because of some of the admissions in this report. Well, well certainly, um, you know, we, we do, you've referenced yourself, we absolutely recognise and did from the outset that how sensitive any issue around memorials would be. Um, Obviously, the chair has given some indication that he will want to write to us 
with yourselves on specific recommendations, exploring just how we presume we will deal with them. Maybe that's, I'm looking at the chair, is that the best way of addressing this issue? Because all we were trying to do is preserve the integrity of the findings of the authors. We then, as you would accept in, like you do when we report to you, we filtered out what was here and what we would let stand. Uh, and we recognised that some of the issues, as I said in my opening remarks, Trevor, were non-starters, uh, but we wanted to be integral to the process. And it's, it links to your second question in terms of um, joint patrolling. I mean, it, it's joint in the sense it could mean at the same time, either side of the border. For example, if you're running a, a breath test operation, it would probably be prudent to try and seek agreement that to prevent people turning around or fleeing, there are vehicles either side of the border. That's what we mean by joint. We do not mean a police officer from here working in another country, nor do we mean a police officer from the Republic working here. I, again, I'm going to draw way back to your remarks, but you did talk about legislative framework, yes. which would suggest what some of us is concerned that would have, mm. what, 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 how we interpret this. The other thing, I mean, there's an, uh, inconsistencies in the report as well, because in the, uh, recommendation 15, it talks about the armoured vehicles and the removal mm. of those within a three to five year period. Mm. But yet, no, in recommendation 18, we're talking about putting bicycles on the street within six months. So you can understand somebody looking at that and saying, well, how can we have a bicycle on the ground in six months, but we have to have armoured police cars for another five years? Surely the bicycles should come after the need to require armoured vehicles. So again, I think that's an inconsistency within the, the body of the recommendations. Yeah, well, again, that's helpful. And I know Mark wants to say something on that. And just to, before I bring him in, because that's some of the work he's looking at, is that, again, to try and sort of put this matter to bed, we absolutely recognise that hot pursuit is an issue that requires both political support and legislation and indeed beyond this route. So that it was a proposal that you know probably has been around, as I understand, for years and years uh, to try and stop people, for example, in crimes in action or where they've you know, committed the most heinous of crimes have been promptly arrested. But it was, I think, my understanding from the authors, it was seen as legitimate because people in both organisations wanted to see a solution. But we do recognise it's not something that either myself or the commissioner can just implement without that explicit legislative change and support. Mark, do you want to pick up the, um, the vehicles? Now? Yeah, no. Um, there's a, I suppose that there's, there's, a, there's a, a question for the whole of the service around threat, ongoing threat levels over the next five to ten years and the continued commission of an armoured fleet. And at the minute, we are, ten, we are continuing to commission an armoured fleet um, because we assess our officers need that. However, in a lot of areas under controlled circumstances, what we're also trying to do is do alternative types of patrolling at certain times. And we've seen this in other, other areas as well, um, uh, where there would be concerns about safety at times as well, where we would sometimes use cycle patrols, but done in a way that ensures that the safety of the officers is paramount. I think what the report is trying to do in this regard, and I wouldn't actually, so it's not exclusive to South Armagh, is encourage uh, the development of community-based visible policing in a way that's not just about how we routinely deploy armored vehicles and there's a, is there a safe way to do it and there has been some instances already down down in South Armagh uh, some of the local police or some uh, local command have been out on bikes and stuff and even we were in a far better position about just 10 or 15 years ago Trevor in other parts of Northern Ireland where we had we had the you know, cycle patrols even in parts of Belfast here which then stopped when the threat went to severe across the entirety of the province so um, it's about not just saying it's one or the other, it's about trying to develop a blended approach, I suppose, to the development of community policing. Uh, the main issue that will be around that will be about the competence of officers, um, appropriate safety for them, appropriate risk assessments. Um, and and those are the things that uh, I'm very keen that, you know, in progressing any of those types of recommendation that um, that is done in, in tandem with the local people, with the local officers and in a safe way. It's not designed, I think, to be contradictory. I think it probably just reflects what's going on in other parts of the province at the moment as well. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's accepted that we have an S and a limited role in some of the recommendations. But are you saying, Chief, that if this board was to write to you formally to ask you to reword some of this document, remove recommendations, even the areas that we have no remit over, that you would consider that favourably? <laughs> I have to say, I think, you know, sort of reacting on the hoof and being accused of sort of um, 
not listening, I suppose. I mean, we are, we are alive to the considerations, and we've already said, for example, on that one, you've mentioned recommendation six, the qualifications there. So I think it's probably best that we can just take an advice between the chair and the chief executive about how we address, in the spirit of good governance, any ambiguities that need to be clarified, because uh, as I, I keep saying, we are not progressing that part of that recommendation. Okay, we, we are going, the board have agreed today to write to the Chief Constable mm -hmm. to get the details of which proposals are being taken forward and the time frames which are being taken forward and we will then scrutinise all of those through the committee. So we do expect to have the detail back again as to which proposals are and are not being taken forward. So that will draw a line under that particular bit. Okay, uh, moving on to some other um, uh, of the board. Next up is Liz, and then Mike, and then Dolores. So Liz Kimmins. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Simon and Mark, for, for your report this morning. I mean, certainly from my perspective, not only as a board member, but as a representative for the area of South Armagh, um, I certainly welcome um, the report. And I think it's important um, to recognize what the crux of this is, um, because for, for too long now, this community have been crying out for better policing. And I think um, it, it's very difficult to dispute um, that when you read the, the reams of, of um, responses that have been submitted as part of the consultation. Um, and I know that, you know, that it's unfortunate that there's been such a knee-jerk reaction over the last number of days, because um, certainly the, the feedback I've been getting on the ground from engaging with people in the community, but also with police um, personnel, is that there's there's definitely a, a willingness and and um, a, an enthusiasm to to see this implemented um, and to see as much um, change as possible. This is you know for us this is certainly an opportunity to deliver um, a new style of policing with the community that's fair um, and it's consistent. And I mean. You know, we talk there about cross-border um, policing. I mean, as a representative of the area, I can identify with some of the issues that were specifically outlined in the report and how that impacts on people's lives every day. So, the, you know, I'm glad that, Simon, you've clarified some of the stuff around that at the beginning of this um, because it's, it's a very practical and it makes sense um, of how we should approach it going forward. So I suppose, um, Simon, what I wanted to ask because, and I'm hoping that um, following today, we will be able to move forward on this um, and just to ask for assurances from yourself and from Mark that there will be no unnecessary delays in seeing the implementation of the really positive um, recommendations within this report and that the community in South Armagh will finally get a, a policing model um, that works with them and, and it works for them. Thanks, Liz. Um, well, absolutely. We, we did try and give some broad outlines of the, the sort of what we foresaw as the the imperatives and, and the scale of the presentation on Tuesday. But I know Mark has already begun some thinking, so I'll, I'll, I'll let him share where we're actually up to, as it were, this morning with you. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a fair way that this report you know, is effectively just about better police and delivery at a local level and better supervision, better management. You know, and uh, and stuff that we've just effectively I brought a group of people together and commissioned a commander to get on with. Um, we always said that there would be some of these other issues which have been ventilated and raised by the board that were more cross cutting and certainly more uh, more more sensitive. Um, and those are the ones that the chief has now described this morning. Um, but the standard issues about you know how we deploy um, uh, our patrolling style and patterns. And modernizing that and bringing that alongside and up to date with how policing is gen it's delivered generally across the rest of, of the provinces you know that works underway and i think you're right i think there's an appetite from most involved um to do that um i think i would say liz that you know there will always be parts of this which i would have to make sure are carefully managed around risk assessments health and safety and in any change process um you know, the people are, are just a critical part of it. You know, there's no point in doing any of this unless we take people with us. Um, otherwise, um, you know, it just won't be as successful as the aspiration to improve policing would be. So um, that's critical for me. Um, and there have been, I think it's also important to recognize that in the sort of the evolution of policing, certainly in South Armagh, there have been critical points before um, where it has taken care and courage, I think, um, by people 
to move it forward from the environment it was in. And certainly we saw that at the end of Operation Open Banner when, you know, police officers were asked to, for example, just drive police cars into the area, with, which they hadn't been asked to do for well over a quarter of a century. And uh, that took a lot, of, um, a lot of professionalism, it took a lot of care, it took a lot of work. Um, I don't think in some respects this, this is as difficult as that was, um, but the same principles about trying to bring people with us, I think are absolutely critical. Um, and, you know, and the support of all sections of the community to help their police officers, help them deliver a better service is critical in that as well. And, that, and that's why I think it's important that, you know, uh, Chief provides the clarifications he wants to provide, um, but also that we move forward in this in a, in a very, you know, um, uh, well planned out way and, and taking people with us. Chair, sure, if I could just come back very quickly on that as well, and thank um, thank you for for the response there. I suppose just I know in, in some of the previous comments, um, you know there has been proposals around change in some of the recommendations, and, and I, I understand some of the concerns around that um, by the members who mentioned it. But I suppose it, I just wanted to put it on record as well. You know that it is important that that we don't start to pull this apart either. That there's some really really important stuff, and, and we we talked um, earlier in the meeting. In the private session around um, patent and how there's still elements of it that haven't been actioned and i don't want us to be talking in five ten years and saying well you know we haven't we haven't got there yet with with the recommendations from the south rmr report because um in its entirety there's some really really key um recommendations that i think will completely transform um policing in this area and i think it's important to keep that in mind and prioritize that to ensure that we're working to the best of of our ability to the time scales outlined. So thank you, Chair, and thank you to Mark and Simon. Okay, thank you, Liz. Uh, going to move rapidly on. Uh, Mike Nesbitt up next, um, and then Dolores. Mike. Well, well, first of all, Doug Beatty and I took ourselves down to South Armagh last Friday because we wanted to see for ourselves uh, the nature of policing in, in the area, and we left in absolutely no doubt that there had to be a step change in how policing is delivered in Sleep Gullion. And a massive issue was the infrastructure. Neither Cross McGlenn nor Newton Hamilton PSNI station is fit for purpose, either for the officers you ask to work out of them or for the communities they serve. So it is deeply regrettable that that's not the focus of this discussion now. But the reason it's not is on you. This is your Amos Bradley moment with that recommendation on memorials. And what I don't understand is why you left it in, because as you acknowledge, Simon, on the 5th of July, we discussed this, and I told you, if you wanted to maintain community support and policing, take it out. But you chose to leave it in. So I do, to an extent, welcome the assurances you've given today that the only moving of memorials will be in the event of a station closure. Uh, but as they say in politics, when you're explaining, you're losing. So I'll move on to the consultation, if I may. Was any third party paid for part of the consultation? I'm not actually sure. I'd have to take that on advice. We can get that answer to you. So I'm told not. So you suggested CRJI basically volunteered. Um, what, what experience or expertise did you perceive them to have in terms of, of doing satisfaction surveys? Well, I think the critical bit, as I said in an answer to an earlier question, Mike, it, it wasn't something that I directly commissioned because I had to give the integrity of what happened to the report authors. Um, I think the issue from the, the what and the why of, of that particular organisation was because in part of the, what came out from the initial work that we did, we recognised as an organisation that our networks weren't up to date and as good as they should be. And frankly, they offered the opportunity to open doors that we just were unable to get through. So it was, if there was going to be so an authenticity to make sure that everybody got a voice, not just one part of the community, it's who could be best work with to, to get those doors opened. And that was the reason for engaging with them and the reason for them commissioning the survey. So you talked about they, they, they put surveys in shops. Uh, I believe they used SurveyMonkey. Can somebody in the PSNI tell me how you assured yourselves that CRJI were going to verify that respondents were residents of South Armagh? 
Well, again, I'll have to come back with that detail because I haven't seen all of that myself. Uh, I wouldn't want to misspeak today in terms of the methodologies and who agreed what and what terms, but that's probably something best to get clarity on in a written answer. Okay, but as you say yourself, Simon, that this, this was the biggest review of policing since Patton 20 years ago. Uh, and yet you're unaware of the methodology of, of, of the consultation. And if we look at Patton and consider it a deep dive, would you accept that you are now splashing about in the children's paddling pool? Well, I, th I think the issue is, I mean, we seem to be sort of agreeing and disagreeing on and different bits of this Th this was always a review that we wanted to make sure had depth and authenticity but first of all it was a review of policing a population of roughly 30,000 people and the activities of about 60 police officers there's a, a, there's a different scale i think the pattern references are, are about it was the first time we've had a chance within the spirit of community and policing ethos to do a deep dive on a particular part of the country as I said earlier, in relation to another question in terms of scale, methodology and resource, there were limitations because of the environment which we worked in. So I don't accept we were splashing around in a paddling pool uh, in that there is, I think you know, you've said it yourself and others have echoed this this afternoon. In relation to 50 recommendations, there's broad consensus on probably 45, 46 of them at the very least. And the ones that we do recognise, as you said yourself, were always going to be the contentious ones are the ones that have caused the upset, the, the, the anger and the frustration. We, we did not not listen to feedback. The, 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 the decision that we just took, we, we, until we brought the report back here, as the chair said, we wanted to keep the integrity of what had been originally presented to us. We'd made our own decisions, as we shared with you at the time, about when Mark did his presentation, what wasn't going to be taken forward, which did include memorials at that point. We gave the summer time for people to visit the police station so they were well informed about any critique as you say that un undoubtedly the infrastructure is past its time yeah. and we want to try and bring this together as a cohesive whole but as trevor has said himself we are not trying to sort of pursue things that don't have either political or public support when they're so emotive as something like a memorial okay I'll, I'll i'll move on there's one other area i'd like to cover simon but but i just put on record i do not understand why, given the scale of this review, which you yourself say is an extra pattern, you were not prepared to spend any money, a fraction of 1% of your budget, to bring in professionals like Ipsos Mori. But the, the, the other area is, is, is about the command. Uh, you may have heard a senior retired officer on the radio this morning questioning the relationships between yourself and senior colleagues. Uh, anytime I've been in a role of, of leadership, I find it very useful to surround myself by people who know the things I do not and to create an environment where they know they can speak out respectfully uh, and that their opinions and their warnings will be heeded. What is your style? Well, I think, first of all, the team around me in the nicest possible way is chosen by yourselves. So you make those judgments as a board at the most senior level about who you want to appoint to support me. Um, so that's the first thing I think it's worth recognising. Uh, I think secondly, I would like to say my style is about openness, integrity and a collaborative way of working so that you know, we have Mark and Pamela today with us as the most senior levels of the team where we absolutely encourage candour, dialogue and debate so that there isn't a one size fits all approach because that's when you know, inevitably you'll get the balance wrong and people can speak for themselves here today in terms of the part they have to play in the team. That was also reflective, Mike, in this particular issue of the amount of time, regardless of some people's personal opinions, that we've tried to do to show that there's been a chance for both local officers and local communities and other stakeholders to participate with some confidence in this report. But we've also debated it in a fulsome way as a senior team. And absolutely, we went through every recommendation as a senior team to try and allow fulsome debate about the rights or wrongs of each one. Now, some of them, as Mark hinted at, that probably people aren't going to have too much of a discussion about the worth of putting officers in marked cars, so that if they're doing patrolling or vehicle checkpoints, they're just more visible and therefore more safe. But there was fulsome debate. And indeed, even after the, um, the 5th of July enterprise, where we came to see you, we've continued that conversation as a team to make sure that we can take issues forward in a way that's consultative, 
and adaptive and reflective of the environment you're trying to work. So that I didn't hear any comments from anyone else on the radio this morning because I've been busy preparing for this meeting. Okay, we need we need to uh, need to move on, and I need to just change the order slightly. Be, uh, we'll come to Dolores and one take. John has got a, a pressing appointment. He's going to have to go to, so I'll bring in John next. John, there. Chair, thank you. And if I could start with a supplementary on the on the uh, review report issues, um, by, by thanking first of all the chief constable, the deputy chief constable, for the clarification offered uh, today. Not least of all that clarification around memorials and police water patrolling. But in relation to the build up to today's discussion, can I ask the chief constable if the leaks in relation to to the review are being investigated? as not for the first time the, these leaks have not been conducive to constructive conversations around competence and policing. They have fed media debate before proper discussion here and have generated, I think it's fair to say, a political rather than a policing discussion. Yeah, thank, it's always such a difficult issue to be quite honest with you because it, it, it clearly at some point there has been a leak and not for the first time in relation to an important policing issue. Uh, people obviously have their own motives and reasons for doing that. Um, I think I need to be cautious in what I say about investigating something because on the other side of the coin, we've spent a lot of time in this room when previously we've investigated journalists, which has then caused consternation and concern. So that um, we have to accept that um, you know these documents, if they're in the hands of police officers, should not be getting shared without due process and permission. But in the world that we live in, it's hard to fully manage that process, and that's one of the realities that we, you know, we all have to face and accept. So that we like to rely on the integrity of the process. We did release under embargo copies of this report and the executive summary to a select number of journalists on Monday because we wanted them to be prepared for what we were doing in uh, in the public meeting on Tuesday. We can only speculate about what happened thereafter. Chair, I want to thank the Chief Constable for that. Well, on a separate issue, can, can I ask him and the senior team for an update on work being done on the issue of violence against women and girls? Um, any progress made on that issue to date? And how any work being done will fit with work also being undertaken by government and led, as far as I understand, by the Executive Office? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think it's probably best, Chair, if we can bring Bobby in on this, because I think only yesterday he was doing some work with some members about this, so if you can. Thanks, Chief, and thanks, John, for the question. Yeah, um, the issue of violence and intimidation against women and girls is a really important one for us, uh, and it really ought to be. We've, we've told the Board previously, in terms of our performance reports, that for the second year running, now both women and girls are now more likely to be the victims of recorded crime than their male counterparts. They're also more likely to be the repeat victims of crime. We have an outcome rate of around 14% in terms of crime against women and girls. And, and simply we think that's not good enough and we need to improve it. And we also know that women and girls are more likely to drop out or in fact not even join the criminal justice system in the first place when it comes to uh, reporting crime and becoming witnesses. So for us, uh, an issue of really significant concern. It is also, of course, an issue of concern nationally in the aftermath of the, the tragic murder of Sarah Everard. Um, and members of the board will be aware of work that is ongoing by both the, the Home Office, you mentioned the executive, uh, but we also have work ongoing nationally through the National Police Chiefs Council. And it was really having had an opportunity to look at their draft work in this area, that we decided to commission a listening event, which took place yesterday, and we were delighted to welcome participants from across the advocacy sector in terms of the safety of women and girls and indeed members of the policing board and we're grateful that they were there as well and we discussed our initial thinking around this drawing on the, the national police chiefs council strategy around moving forward to try and do more to make women and girls feel safer uh, in both the public uh, arena but also online as well we're also very conscious of the importance and i know the deputy will want to say something on this as well specifically about the behavior conduct and culture within policing to make sure that that is right and that people have confidence that when they come forward and that they report to police officers that the issues that they bring will be taken seriously. Um, there are, is a great deal we are continuing to do with our partners across the criminal justice system in order to make the justice journey as effective as it can be for victims and witnesses, but also that there's a tailored needs assessment that's built into that as well. And we also have a specific focus as well on crime recording and we're really interested in the discussions that are ongoing nationally around 
extending the definitions of hate crime to include gender uh, and indeed the work of Judge Marion in that area. But I don't know if maybe the deputy will want to say some more on that as well. I think you pretty much nailed it there, uh, Bobby, to be honest. Um, I suppose just I'll touch on the conduct issue again. Um, one of the emerging themes in police conduct over the last couple of years has been uh, the use of position for sexual gain. Uh, it's effectively police officers form relationships with victims or witnesses of crime, uh, particularly victims. Um, uh, it is a theme that's emerging across every police service. It's something that uh, as deputy I'm dealing with um, within our service at the minute. And we have had officers convicted in court in relation to these types of things. Um, and, you know, this being a public forum as well, we're always, would, would, would appeal to people, you know, particularly people who are victims of crime, you know, if you feel at all that, that a police officer is unduly exploiting you, um, then you should tell somebody and happily tell us. Um, we don't want that at all. We're not going to tolerate it in any shape or form. A police officer's interactions with you should be purely professional, solely related to the matter for which is under investigation and the appropriateness of support around that. There should be no level of personal um, uh, or off-duty uh, contact uh, around any victim or any witness. And uh, you know, I, I don't much like the word zero tolerance. I just think it's overused, but uh, it's one of these areas where I think we need to be absolutely clear with, uh, with, with the public that it's not something that they should put up with in any shape or form and they should report it. And they are doing, but again, it's difficult. So again, I, uh, and this does, I think, have impact upon um, Part of this area of the the debate around misogyny, the murder of Sir Everard, um, and uh, and the you know and cultures within policing. So, uh, and one which as uncomfortable as it may be for policing at times, it's something that I'm very keen that we would pull out into the open uh, and get on and deal with. Chair, sure, I'm very grateful for that and the work undertaken by by Bobby and the team that really saw some off yesterday. I'm looking forward to progressing this this um, th through this board and its various committees. Okay, thank you uh, for that answer. Dolores. Uh, Chair, <clears throat> sorry, I'll just be brief. Um, I mean, the Chief and others will know that our party has welcomed uh, the report in the main. Um, but the, you did say, Chief, uh, in terms of uh, implementation, obviously the board and others will be looking at that and we'll see an action plan. But I think given uh, the commitment and uh, involvement of the local community in the review, I think it's reasonable for them to expect very visible improvement in policing uh, pretty quickly because a lot of it isn't rocket science, to be quite honest with you. It's the sort of policing that many of our communities have experienced over the last 20 years and for the last 20 years. So I just wonder in terms of the quick wins and indeed improvement in response times. I know that my colleagues uh, have raised uh, issues uh, with some of your colleagues in, in relation to response times. Uh, and I just wonder what immediate improvements are you going to put in place? I'll, 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 I'll let Sir Mark bring in some of the detail here because it, it is about, as many commentators have said even today, it's not losing the, the sort of the progress and the consensus that we want to improve things for the sake of um, one or two important recommendations. And before Mark comes in, because I know again he's been sort of doing a lot of preparatory work on this and he leads on wider performance issues for us as well, that the independent advisory group is not something to be overlooked when we talked about holding this in a place where we can use people from the community going forwards to actually shape the future of policing in that locality. And it's an idea we want to see ex extended eventually across other parts of the country. Mark, do you want to just touch yeah, on Yeah, I mean, just quickly uh, through the chair, um, uh, every vehicles have already been started to be deployed in South Irma, um, and, uh, and that's entirely uh, congruent with every other part of Northern Ireland. And, uh, uh, still offering officers the option at times for certain reasons not to have to drive a delivery vehicle but they are now on the ground and have been on, on the ground in every vehicle or myself. Um, the district commander is proceeding with issues around shift patterns and other matters, the matters that board members have raised particularly around overtime and deployment. Um, the work around response times is ongoing somewhere where we're very keen that there would be you know a quicker uh, a quicker um, uh, outcome for people, you know, it's, it's to see that to see that happen um, much more quickly. Um, again, but because practices have, have been ongoing for a long time, and you can't, I mean, I think it's important to say this, you know, um, you can't blame police officers for what they were told to do and for how, you know, how we have led them. And, you know, so we have to try and, you know, and we're changing practices 
um, you know, bring them forward with us. Uh, and uh, and I think that's really important. And this just can't be left at the feet of of people who who, who work in the area. So um, I would be keen that uh, Dolores that people do see uh, change. Um, um, but again, I want the change to last. I don't want it to be effective. And uh, and therefore, we just you know where we going with that. Um, but I'm pretty confident that the, the command team down there will be able to achieve that, and the people should see difference. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Tom Buchanan is up next. Um, just checking, Joanne, did you want to come back? Just been informed that Linda's hand is raised. I can't see it online, but we'll bring in Linda after that. So, Tom Buchanan next. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Chief, for your um, clarity this morning in the private session and also the opening remarks in the public session. That really has been helpful. And I know that you did um, uh, make mention of the concerns that were raised on the 5th of July, but that you felt you best bring the report through in its original form uh, to the board. But you did have the opportunity to provide the clarity on the media in the last few days, and you chose not to do that. And I think if you had done that, that would have eased a lot of the tension and the concern within the unionist community. And also, uh, which also diminished, caused further diminishing of the support for the police at the top level. And I have to be honest, because I've got this through my office and through my telephones and, and everything. And therefore, uh, this did cause uh, a lot of concern within the unionist community. But there was the opportunity for you to do that. And unfortunately, for some reason, that wasn't done. But it is welcome news that you're not progressing with the recommendation on the memorials. However, there are other recommendations in this that uh, has ra raised concern. You know what they are. So can I ask you now today then for clarity on how many of these recommendations you intend to take forward and how many you intend to let drop and not take forward? Yeah, okay, thanks, Sam. Well, I, I think firstly, um, going back to your, your helpful comments, I think no one will pretend it's not a matter of absolute regret that some people have been misled in terms of what we intended to do in relation. Particularly, I think we'd all agree that it's the issue around memorials and how they were treated or perceived to be treated that caused the most consternation. It is a matter of public record, Tom, and I appreciate your support, but I set that out at the outset on Tuesday in the meeting with, with a wide range of people from the community. and. At the media briefings that followed thereafter, the general tone was on the same place, that we weren't progressing that recommendation, and that also we had to be honest with people. If we did come to a point where we exit from, in this particular instance, Cross McGlenn, we would have to have a conversation in the way I've outlined about memorials. In the fast-paced nature of the media world we're living in, we can all live in the hindsight world, but we wanted, as I said in the previous session, there was a dilemma about just completely continuing sort of responding to an emerging story and sort of playing almost like a game of ping pong on such an emotive issue and respecting the place of this board to hold me and others to account about the, the authenticity, the intention, so that you weren't finding out from another fora as board members about what we were trying to do on such an important issue. I think it's helpful if we can walk away today trying to put the, the, the matter straight. In terms of the specifics about which of 450 recommendations absolutely stand and, and, and which fall, I don't think Mark's actually in that position yet because he's in the sort of foothills of the organization, the prioritization. But for the, again, to emphasize the clarity in, in re recommendation six, which I imagine people will quote over and over, the issue of the memorials is not within the part that we're taking forward. And clearly, as we've said, Tom, that there are some things whilst they're there in, in, in sort of I can't necessarily say black and white, I think it's green and white, but um, the, in the report that um, hot pursuit requires legislative uh, agreement and therefore political support. So that would be not something that, that we can ever think we can progress quickly. It would be a matter for others as to whether they see this consensus to do that. Some of the other things, and again, we've got the Federation in the room today, we've got to negotiate sort of locally if there's changed the shift patterns and things like that. But I don't know if there's anything else you can sort of share at the moment about the sort of, if you like, the programme plan which the I, chair has already asked for. I suppose I'd just reiterate the point that the Chief has clarified the position of memorials, that 
a cross border pursuit. Um, you know, whilst it's been it's there as some as as a as a a tactic that people want to see is there. It's, it's really a, totally outside our gift, and therefore you know, I can't progress it. It's a matter. It's you know it's a legislative issue. Um, Chief mentioned the Irish language issue. Well, that's again something that refers to whether or not, as a public sector, there is um, a requirement through the executive to do so. So I, those are the types of things that you know I don't think it's top of my head, and we won't be unilaterally moving forward on. So. Thank you, um, uh, my chief. However, on the cross-border issues, there there is quite a bit of ambiguity between what you're saying and what's within the report. And Trevor touched on one part of it. There's another part of it here which says that by by annual reporting by police service of Northern Ireland and Angarda, who's that reporting to? Well, again, uh, that, that I think it's somewhere from memory between is it forty-five and. 49 and the recommendations yes. probably I haven't got it open yet in front of me again that this is very much in 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 the field of a, a proposal um, and that's something we've got to firstly satisfy ourselves on about the reason they're doing what we need consensus from from our colleagues in and Garda corner but all this if you recall you may have seen this in other parts of what you've done uh, in the board or other places the joint agency task force which is said in the introduction it is, is a body that has support from both organisations. In, in a non-COVID era, there's usually an annual conference where the two organisations effectively share good practice and bring a summary of where we are on organised crime issues. And in broad terms, that was the thinking in relation to the, the issues that affect, if you like, volume crime and, and the matters that are of more import to the, the community. But as I said at the start, we we're in the starting gate in the foothills of some of these recommendations they are not fully formed and it's the opportunity for mark to, to work with colleagues to build that consensus and bring back where there are clearly issues that would have a locus around the board in terms of accountability we're not going there to try and usurp the role of the board or indeed any other mechanisms that should be there we're just trying to see how we get better consistency across two sides of the border about how we police day-to-day -day issues and that's the detail that I know Mark will, will, will want to work on in the next few months. Okay. <clears throat> and, uh, Chair, just one issue on the ANLA issue in Northern Derry, and I know there's touched on uh, this morning in the private session with regards to the helicopter issue. I'm not only touched on that, but given what has happened, what implications will this have for the future Republican commemorations? Because it seems to be that the, the Republican commemorations can go ahead whenever they want, using whatever facilities they have, weapons, whatever, and the police are standing back on the sidelines, and this is allowed to continue. So what implications is it going to have for future recommendations? Uh, was this a breach of the ceasefire? What knowledge did the PSNI have that weapons were going to be uh, brought onto the street on that particular occasion? And what level of evidence gathering has been taken at the commemoration in order for to bring to book those that were in breach of the law um, on that particular occasion thanks um th i think there's, there's there's a few very important points you, that you raised there um one of our difficulties in certainly in the public session because there is the general issue of how we police commemorations whether it's at the prospect of a show of strength as well as the things that have caused concern recently um, in relation to the issue that is probably most up, uppermost in people's minds in the Gallia area, we are somewhat limited that we, we can say to you at the moment, not that we're trying to dodge the question, uh, but we are awaiting clarity from the Ombudsman about whether she is going to effectively call herself in to look at the, the police response to that incident. And we don't have that finality yet. So I don't want to get into a place where I'm accused of trying to fetter what she might want to look at or, or understand. I think it's fair to say that in relation to that, there was a policing operation with a defined structure that was taking place on that evening. There were local and specialist resource in, in the sense of the tactical support group there uh, and, and, and there were other tactics considered. There have been other activity, even quite recently, that we have policed out and stopped. And I know Mark is very strong on this, that his clear direction to the operational commanders that work for both of us is that we see no place for these shows of strength and really 
the, the unequivocal sort of look forward that you will police these out in a safe way that's consistent with our training and guidance. But I don't know whether you want anything else on that, Mark. Um, just um, the NLA or criminal gang, um, you know, and we're actively working against the NLA. I want to reassure the board and the public of that. Um, I'm very clear on that. Um, the, uh, there has been one arrest in relation to that show of strength, and, uh, and we're going to continue to work against them. Uh, you mentioned the ceasefire issue. Um, normally, that the commentary effectively comes from the Northern Ireland office about breach of ceasefires. So, um, but our work against them primarily in the moment is about their their, their criminality against the community at the minute, um, which is fairly extensive um, in certain communities, and, and uh, that needs to be said. So, um, and uh, our view is that you know that you know these shows of strength. Um, you know, shouldn't be allowed, but there has to be a proportionate response to that we can't dictate to commanders every time how they do that, because there are varying circumstances at each, at each time, and we expect commanders under the law and under the rules to uh, be able to, to deliver a proportionate operation to try and prevent things happening, things happening, and if they don't prevent them, then to make sure that there's a robust investigation afterwards. Can I just briefly say, in, in both relation to the INLA, show of strength and indeed to the South Armagh report are, you know in terms of coercive control of paramilitaries and same in East Belfast and everywhere else I just wonder where is that taken account of in relation to people being able to come forward to provide evidence and support to police and it's the same in relation to, to some ex extent in terms of South Armagh and especially in the murder of Paul Quinn for example um, and I know there's an ongoing Garda investigation with yourselves so you know I just wonder at some point when if you are looking at revising the South Amar report at some stage you might look at coercive control influencers in, in uh, some areas because I have huge concerns around tech and paramilitarism and the ongoing coercive control of people who are now community workers. Yeah, I, I think that, that that is probably a whole bigger issue, Dolores, for perhaps even another day because he's not here today because uh, he's on leave, frankly. The, Mark McEwen is looking at how we bring together the different strands and capabilities that we already have to see if there's a fresh approach we can bring to tackling serious and organised crime. Because we, we didn't have really have chance thus far today to talk about it, but clearly, even in the, the matter of the moment in, in South Omar, that is one of the issues that we want to work with community and other agencies to, to do more to disrupt and to prevent in quite an unequivocal way that Mark rightly says. We have numerous active uh, lines of inquiry in relation to a number of criminal gangs at the moment, and we will continue to pursue them. Um, with, with, with all the vigour and tactics that we can bring to bear, either to disrupt to, or, or to dismantle those. And we, as you know, it's hidden in the report today, unfortunately, but uh, we sent the quarterly update on serious organised crime to you as members on the back of this report, and it gives you some sense of the continued determination to do that. But I think the police do have to look very closely at who some of their partners are. Okay, point well made, Dolores. Thank you. Um, I, I, we're just on the R, but I'm going to keep keep it going. I want the questions to, to be covered fully. So uh, going to Linda online and then back in the room to Joanne and uh, to Michael. Uh, so uh, Linda Dillon. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and thank you to all of our presenters today. Just a very quick question on the event that happened yesterday, the engagement event. I just want to know you've said that there were um, representatives from across advocacy groups. I'm just wondering, does that include from the migrant community and um, I'm thinking in particular um oh my god hello we can hear you Linda yeah okay sorry chair I just I thought I'd lost you I'm thinking in particular those who may have um issues in relation to their right to remain where they come forward for example with with um where they're a victim of either domestic or sexual violence and they have issues around right to remain in particular circumstances it could potentially be their partner who's been the the alleged perpetrator and their right to remain may well rely on that very same person just wondering were those people represented at that event yesterday and what issues were raised if they were Thanks, Linda. I think it's best to bring Bobby back in again because he, he facilitated the event yesterday so he, he can bring up to speed with uh, where they got. 
Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Linda. Um, I, I can reassure you that they were represented. In fact, we had a number of representatives from um, both the black and ethnic minority communities and, um, and other minority groups as well, who were all keen to stress the particular importance in this area of intersectionality and the increased vulnerability that it, it can create for potential victims. So it was a point that we heard very loudly and clearly yesterday and that we'll be keen to incorporate into the strategy as we bring it forward. Just to come back on that, Chair, sorry, Bobby, I'm very specifically concerned about people whose right to remain rely potentially on the person who's the alleged perpetrator. But even outside of that, people who have issues around their their right to remain here and then a fear to bring themselves forward because they could potentially be sent back to somewhere that they've had to leave in, in God knows what circumstances. No, and again, I can provide you with reassurance that that very issue was raised and heard very loudly by us yesterday and will be reflected as we go forward in, in terms of the strategy. And we're very clear that people are victims first um, and that we need to do everything we can to provide them with the services that they're entitled to. OK, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. All right, thanks for that. Uh, Joanne. Thank you, Chairman. Chief Constable, uh, I welcome your words this afternoon, your words of clarification. But there's no question that the South Armagh Review report and its handling um, are another self-inflicted wound on you and the PSNI. And proposals are being brought forward and it appears already been retracted within the space of a couple of days because of public backlash which I think indicates uh, that their inclusion was ill-considered in the first place. And that's another story. But before you decided to publish these recommendations and open the discussion on them, uh, some, of, some of these which relate to highly sensitive and emotive issues and political issues, um, what consideration did you give to the impact of those on my community and much of wider society in Northern Ireland who take the view that this is yet more pandering to Sinn Féin and the IRA. And what do you say to those people? Thanks, Joanne. Um, well, firstly, um, I think we've made some progress today in terms of trying to bring some clarity to 50 recommendations. Broadly, I think the consensus is that, as we've rehearsed a few times, most of us agree with most of them. Um, I don't want to set hairs running, so I'll try and choose my words carefully. I'm not sure it's quite accurate to describe it. We've just recanted because of a backlash. Uh, obviously, we're not tone deaf to, to the concerns that have been raised, not just in the last few days, but previously, in, in the sense that you're talking, Joanne, about two-tier policing. And we've tried really hard over the summer, um, both in this particular space, Mark, Bobby, myself, and some others, about reaching into um, the community which you, you, you would represent to see what, what we're doing well or where we need to improve and we continue to do that in the weeks and months ahead and we'll want to bring proposals through some other work that Bobby's doing about engagement in a more strategic way and also how we get consistency into neighbourhood policing so that'll be a, a forthcoming piece of work. Um, I think it's again about restating and this is clearly something lost in the translation and obviously um, Pamela here today is with us with a lot of experience about governance and audit and how to do things that notwithstanding where we find ourselves we just wanted to be true to the process that the report authors collected the evidence and put their stamp on things as they saw it they synthesized information for right from a variety of sources and presented the report to us we we did say and, and again it's clearly lost in translation i did say from the get-go on tuesday the clear things that were out of scope and they, you know, again, for the sake of clarity, were the issues around Irish language, the memorials, and indeed, as the discussion went on, the recognition that hot pursuit had to be linked to legislative change. So that we are not sort of running to stand still and, and making things up as we go along in this meeting today and trying to just fast time say what's in and what's out. The chair has given a clear direction, which I welcome, that there's an action plan to bring us some structure, sense of prioritisation, and I guess eventually resources were relevant to some of the proposals. And indeed, as Mark has said on more than one occasion, both to me internally as well as today, some of the issues there have a wider implication for the organisation, which where the minute of our original meeting said that we would need to take them on a 
considered step by step basis. So that you know, I think with, without going back to sort of first principles, things like visible police vehicles are things that we're not changing. We think it's valid. The other things we've just been having to do is add clarity to messaging we were trying to give out with integrity to the people that participated in the report on Tuesday. Thank you. Um, your comments there lead me into to my next question. I mean, I don't believe that a bunker, which is what it is, in Cross McGlen, um, and over a million pounds annually spent on overtime to police that, um, have led to enormous successes against the IRA and all other criminal gangs in South Armagh. But given the depth of feeling about this, um, do you and your senior executive team understand that this not only reinforces some people's views, now together with other issues, like the INLA versus a pastor in Larn and the overkill that there was there, that, that all of that serves to reinforce not only uh, views of two-tier policing, but it causes immense damage to the work that you, Bobby, and some of us are engaged in with regard to confidence and engagement in the PSNI uh, from the unionist community. My community is now questioning our further participation in this board, and they don't see the point of it. And they're, they're saying to us, um, and I quote one email that I received, end this farce. So all of this has caused massive damage. It, is, it has been a PR disaster, frankly. Um, and good stuff that is in that report is now being lost as a result of it. So do you, Chief Constable, and your senior executive team understand the damage? Reassure us, please, that the PSNI gets it. And tell us what you're going to do to fix the damage that has uh, ensued as a result of the handling of this report. Yeah, well, thanks, Joanne. I, I think, firstly, un unequivocally, um, A, it's been useful to try and bring some clarity to proceedings and, and detail today in, in the spirit that a number of uh, members have done, because without that, we might have been stuck on the, the sort of start point that, that we had been. Um, I think, again, it, it, it's, it's, it's about a matter of regret, particularly, um, I'm not just speaking to yourself, but beyond this room, that people, not just that are in the unionist community, but actually people that have suffered the loss of their, their husband, their father, their son, who again, only recently, I was with widows and parents in another place with Mark actually, where we were listening to their heartache before this report was published, that anything that has come out of this has been interpreted as trying to sort of not recognize the sacrifice that these people have made. That was not the intention, neither the review, no one thinks to pretend that it was, or the way it's been handled. I think you know we, we will have to look deeply into our soul to see, as Trevor said, uh, how in, in, in our desire to bring the report in its fulsome sort of process contained that one sort of subsection, the one bullet point about memorials, and it's being presented as something we agreed with, with when we were pains to stress that we weren't. In terms of the broader question of where we go next, well, clearly uh, we've got further meetings today with for example, yourselves, um, what, where we can listen and explore. We've done a lot of work, as you know, over the summer at different levels of the organization and the community as well to, to demonstrate we're listening. Um, I, I won't say f too much, but we've had feedback actually that has been constructive, that there's been recognition over the summer months that, as Deirdre said earlier, when we've not even had a chance to discuss the detail of some of today's report, we have enjoyed a summer where there hasn't been the anticipated violence and disorder because of some of the hard work between local officers, commanders and communities and representatives to keep, if you like, a lid on things. I think the next thing you're going to see from us in terms of a signal about where we want to take things, because I'm conscious that commodity is a word that's often used, it's, 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 a, it's something that can be lost in an instant and takes time to rebuild. And that Bobby is also doing work on, um, on the engagement strategy and other people are doing some work on what we've described actually in today's report as a forthcoming signal as hallmarks of good neighborhood policing. So we want to bring forward some proposals that again, we want to consult on about what good looks like across the country, because two tier policing isn't always this evident in what a neighborhood policing team does. We've had conversations about things you've recognized in the past. Uh, for example, the policing of, of public order, you, you mentioned different sort of uh, issues where an arrest of somebody in one part of the country is then compared with policing a show of strength in another. 
Um, but we want to see that as I think, you know, even in my sort of time here over two years in conversations, we've had some sort of sort of consensus around good neighborhood policing has always been something everyone in this room and their predecessors have signed up to. So when you say what next, I think that's something that we want to try and marshal our energy and our thinking on with the support of people in the board and beyond about what good does look like so we can sign up to it collectively. It is not about a one size fits all approach, but some, some basic thinking to make sure that the one thing that despite some of the commentary and narrative of the last 48 hours about this report has shown that there is consensus that policing needs to improve, not just in this part of the country, but in other communities. To what extent can you use some of this thinking to, it, to, to enable us to do that in a considered and structured way? And actually to make sure that as, as even in where we are this afternoon, that some of the good work that's in this report for that local community aren't lost either. So I'm more than happy, as I know, um, you know, not the whole senior team is here today for various reasons, but as it affects broadly the operational policing collective, not to exclude Pamela, but for example, Mark, who's got a lot of experience of the past, Bobby, who's doing a lot of valiant work with partners, stakeholders and other people, want to continue to build on experience in the room beyond to make sure that we do make the policing service as best we can be. It is a matter of regret. that, As Deirdre said earlier, almost every time we sit down here to discuss the policing plan and issues, and you said that yourself earlier, Joanne, that we seem to be knocked off course by events that cause a lot of consternation and controversy. It would be nice if we can proceed into the autumn, try and draw a line on some of these issues, convince people we're serious about the good things this report and remedy any confusion. Okay, thank you. We are drawing to conclusion now. Uh, Michael Atkinson uh, has the final question. Unless there's anybody who has a burning question, which case do indicate to me and I'll try and keep an eye out for it. But otherwise, Michael with the final question. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, good afternoon, Chief Council. Uh, and just bearing in mind where you got to at the end of that last response, I did want to switch focus a bit towards the policing plan. Um, and I think I think sort of at these sessions we need to find more time to to con concern ourselves with that debate. The board um, worked closely with the PS and I senior team last year uh, with through a working group to review the appropriate performance measures to sit beside the three outcomes uh, within the 2025 policing plan, safe community confluence and policing, and importantly, thirdly, the engaged communities header. And this led to the introduction of two new measures against outcome three designed to test not only the PSNI's sort of view of the world and how effective they were at joint problem solving with communities, but also importantly to test the effectiveness of the partnership working with local communities in the eyes of the community stakeholders themselves. Uh, and that was to include, but not exclusively, in areas of higher deprivation and victimization. Um, the metrics have only been introduced into the plan recently, I, I accept that, but I, I wondered if, if the Chief Constable might provide us with some feedback on the importance that you attach to this work, not least in, in light of the outworkings of the South Armagh report, uh, and how you intend to push forward with the implementation of the measures and the reporting associated with them, please. Well, firstly, um, there's a few layers to this, um, and uh, Mark may well want to come in. In, in terms of the, the framework, Mark is doing a lot of work with colleagues, if you like, back at the ranch to cement the measures into our performance regime, which is a is an evolving piece of work. Um, there were some measures within the plan and indeed beyond that plan, which are sort of sort of numeric about objectives we want to achieve that lend themselves to data collection, uh, where we can sort of assess trends. My Mark touched on Bond before the work he's doing to improve response times, which is an issue we want to see improved, not just in South Omar, but in other parts of, of the country. Um, some of the stuff you talk about here is, is it, it is it's harder to directly assess um, in terms of how do you put a quotient on what good problem solving is, or indeed what a good partnership is. And I know from previous conversations I've had with the Chief Executive, for example, we are keen to see that what we can do to encourage PCSPs to, to, to bring their experience to the table, but work collaboratively right across the districts to make sure that partnership working is more effective, it's more joined up, it's more consistent, and we share good practice. So that's something you know I'm passionate about, and I've called in other places in past times that I do think there's some gaps. So a community safety board, 
for Northern Ireland could set strategy that involves other partners, other public sector bodies, so that we can actually bring our expertise to the table. And there's been some hints of that today, whether it's from Linda's recent comments or indeed some of the other conversations. So we, we recognise the importance of partnership working because we don't have all the answers and it's about making use of the best. In terms of problem solving, um, it seems there's quite a lot in Bobby's intro at the moment. Um, but again, I'm just down the end of the table, but we've just launched our problem solving model, which is on the back of the crime prevention strategy. Um, and he's doing a lot of work with one of our superintendents to make sure that now comes to life within the organization as a way of framing what we do in a consistent way and where we can using evidence and good practice, not only to address an issue in the moment, but to stop repetition. I think only this morning, I saw an email at work about some new work that's gone live today on our pulse system, which is the performance portal about a better measurement and assessment of repeat victimization in relation to things like domestic abuse. So that I think was a really good state of progress, but I don't know, I know time's precious, but whether Mark wants to say any more broadly about the work he's doing on, on, on improving the performance regime. Um, no, thanks, Michael. And I mean, I just was, it's fair to say that I, I too would support uh, a regular conversation about the pacing plan. I think it should be driving your available in our business, but I also respect very carefully that there are issues that this board needs to raise with us that are cross cutting and needed, needed to be raised. And I'm under no illusions about the depth of feeling um, here and also in the community about these matters. So they have to be ventilated and it's proven upon people like me to make sure then also that we get on with uh, these these very important matters about the actual the delivery of placing to people, which is pretty much individual because this is about crime, crime prevention. Uh, I think personally that the last, the, the policing plan as constructed and the reporting mechanisms is probably one of the best, at, you know, attempts we've had at this in my time on the senior executive team and also my time as a chief superintendent, superintendent. I think a lot of progress has been made. I think that there is a diligence in the organization around reporting to it. And a, that is that has developed and i think that the uh, again whilst i respect the frustrations of the board around how fast it's moving i also think that there's an analysis and a forensicness a sort of forensicality around this in the board that probably wasn't as present before so i mean i would encourage everyone that there is progress um around these structures uh, we're about to we'll be involved in conversations with these structures for next year i'd like to see the effectively the balanced scorecard approach that we have develop more I suppose the one thing um, I would say is that I sometimes think we try to solve too much with the reporting mechanisms. Um, there's some of the stuff that just can't be measured that well, um, certainly on the current framework. There is, I think, it has to be a balance, certainly in this uh, jurisdiction around qualitative reporting and quantitative. I think it has to be. I think, as I said in other fora, we, are, we have a dearth of ways of um, assessing qualitative performance and you know, we talked earlier in a different report about just about uh, about the commissioning of work you know we've had this discussion with the doj um you know we would and, and progress is being made but we will benefit more from the ability to do more qualitative analysis and um survey work with our with our communities about what's affecting them what's not affecting them um i've often said that the crime data would would benefit hugely from a proper anonymous crime survey in northern ireland to assess the actual rates of unreported crime and to balance those against the reported crime that we have so that we can see where the gaps are i've said in many occasions this is far more available in england and wales than it is here and allows you to get a sense of baseline of of reporting levels and performance and community concern I think given our history as a community and concerns about underreporting, which I think transcends across the UK, um, but we have some specific issues here that we would benefit from that. I would really strongly encourage us as a group of people to try and push forward into that in the next couple of years as well to see if we can get more data in that area. I do think that we could come to the board and then the board could could really assess, you know, uh, what the differences are and, you know, without going on too long chair, but, you know, there's issues that affect rural communities that are different to urban communities. Massive levels of underreporting we know in disability crime, uh, violence against women, um, hate crime, and also underreporting in what we would also call volume crime. When people think, well, there's no point in reporting because you can get an outcome. So there's lots of work there, and um, but I do think that the work over the last year, I think, has has certainly moved us forward. I mean, just a quick comment to that. Thanks, thanks very much for for those replies. 
And I think the, the under-reporting one, Mark, is one that you've explained to me a bit as symptomatic in Northern Ireland and to some extent prevents us from doing effective benchmarking really with some, some of the other parts, which I suppose my perspective would on it that we, even the qualitative data itself, uh, the acid test of finding out how the communities actually feel about how we're doing and trying to do that in some sort of robust way uh, to the extent that you can so that we can determine on a year-on-year -year basis whether we're getting better or worse or whatever in some of these areas with with a, a more robust feel to the analysis. But anyway, thanks thanks very much for those responses. Thank you for that. I've been notified one final question after the, the, the troll. Uh, Dolores has got a question on recruitment. Dolores. Yeah, well, sure, I had indicated you know, said earlier, but, you know, recruitment and representation, you have it contained within your report, still market decline in terms of representation in the Catholic national community, huge recruitment drive uh, going forward, I think, in November and ongoing in relation to police civilian staff. Uh, I want to uh, see what specific actions the police are taking to address some of those uh, gaps. Uh, if not uh, available now, I'm happy to receive that after the meeting. Yeah, thanks, sir. It's, 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 it's probably a good clarion call to, to put on notice, really, that we are about to be in a, an ambitious yeah. recruitment campaign to bring in over 500 officers, and there are ongoing recruitment for police staff posts. Uh, ironically, I was uh, speaking to Pamela only this morning about this uh, in, in relation to wider matters, so I, I think it's probably best, given the time, that we provide the answer to the, the campaign question, if you like, about what are the objectives and where we're going to actually make sure that the recruitment is, as far as we can uh, be assured, one that reaches out to all the communities in Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you to uh, everyone who has been involved today. It's a long day for board members have been for quite some time, but to the Chief Constable, uh, Deputy Chief Constable, Chief Operating Officer and Assistant Chief Constable, thank you all for coming and taking the questions today. Our next uh, public meeting is on Thursday the 7th of October and thank you to the several hundred people who have been with us online for this final session. I think we have uh, a given opportunity for the questions to be asked. There has been clarity that has been received uh, and we will look forward to receiving that in written detail um, so that we can continue to monitor what's happening specifically around the uh, South Armagh Review. But thank you all for joining us today.